प्लीज गो एट सेल रियल लाइफ ओके सो गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन होप एवरीबॉडी एवरीबॉडी इज बीइंग सेफ एंड हेल्दी एंड आई वेलकम ऑल द पैनलिस्ट एंड द पार्टिसिपेंट्स इन दिस वेबिनार विद थीम इलनेस टू वेलनेस मेंटल हेल्थ एंड वेलबीइंग ड्यूरिंग कोविड-19 एंड बिफोर स्टार्टिंग एंड सेइंग एनीथिंग आई वुड लाइक टू जस्ट कोट टू स्टेटमेंट्स बाय कार्ल यूंग आई एम नॉट व्हाट हैपेन टू मी आई एम व्हाट आई चूज टू बी and uh, these two statements are self explanatory uh, and they mean that whatever you are and wherever you are in your life is because of the choices you made in your life and that is what also the theme is about illness to wellness the paradigm shift <clears throat> and also empowering yourself and i'm very happy uh, and pleased to uh, announce the panelists here with us the presence of dr murli rao professor and chairman of department of psychiatry and behavioral sciences Loyola University Medical Center Chicago he is also the medical director of Mindful DMS Neurocare all over India founder of National Network of Dep uh, Depression Center India and he is also the author of very famous book 50 plus healthy uh, aging Dr Shamshir Divedi chairman of Neurosciences and director of clinical services Vimhans Neethi Super Speciality Hospital and he is also associated with Fortis Memorial Research Institute Gurdas he is the first neurologist who performed first symbolysis in stroke in india in 1998 in hand dr prakriti kodar managing trustee for dar foundation and managing director for dar wellness limited the chief strategy officer of the national women parliament and she single handedly uh, has done strategic planning and uh, has won various awards in mental health mr ranil rajput chairman chairperson association sanskar council Dr. Swati Chawla, psychologist and health, health and wellness expert, as our today's panelist for the discussion. Now, I would like to invite Mr. Anil Rajput to address our panelists with a welcome speech. Good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, you know, I am really feeling uh, proud. It's my privilege to welcome such an eminent panelist from all over the globe. i am really thankful uh, to dr morley rao and prakriti podar to join us from overseas and i am very grateful to dr shamshir divedi uh, and dr uh, swati chawla to join us and my heartfelt thanks to divakshi sharma to to conduct the uh, event today i would also like to thank all the participants who have taken time to join us for this webinar <clears throat> the subject of today's webinar is most topical and requires our unmitigated attention for a good part of this year the world has been fighting a fierce battle against covid-19 pandemic with nearly 23 million cases worldwide which includes approximately 3 million in india it is abundantly clear that this adversary is both formidable and lethal humanity has no choice but to try and fight this adversary because it is a very very formidable and lethal we have to ride this storm in the best possible manner it is going to be a long and protracted engagement and one that has and will for at least some time ahead cause unprecedented damage in every walk of life <clears throat> it is not only economic social or the individual health of the people it is going to affect our mental health in a very very extreme way covid-19 has impacted the human body in ways never seen before if one is unfortunate enough to contract this virus 
then science is still adding to the list the wide ranging damage that it has inflicted on the human body the lungs the lung heart and the other vital organs are all susceptible to the scourge of the covid-19 virus all this has led to a tremendous increase in anxiety fear an impending sense of doom for a large number of otherwise healthy people today singles who are sitting at home in isolation are feeling extremely challenged to deal with this environment with work from home being the new normal for many months the whole family ecosystem has been disturbed and poses a new set of challenges for the people the reality is that man is a social animal and the need for communication varies and <clears throat> when people are unable to engage socially a mechanism that puts in place an altogether new ecosystem becomes extremely important to ensure that sound mental health people are also having to reorient themselves and balance work along with keeping good mental and physical health i'm sure that these particular aspects will be looked at closely by the specialists who are part of this webinar in addition this pandemic has exacerbated the mental health of those who are anyway prone to anxiety or are suffering from depression mood swings and other mental ailments to put things in perspective the world health organization estimates that one in four people in the world will be affected by mental or neurological disorder at some point in time in their lives around 450 million people currently suffer from such conditions placing mental disorder amongst the leading causes of ill health and disability worldwide in india the national mental health survey 2015-16 reveals that nearly 15% of indian adults need active intervention for one or more mental issues and one in 20 indian <coughs> suffer from depression all this was before entry of covid-19 pandemic this situation has increased job insecurities added new form of stresses and with no clarity about the immediate future there is no doubt in my mind that these members and the magnitude of this challenge has increased substantially ever since the world has buffeted by the covid-19 virus exactly how we can address this issue and what are the measures and the protocols that need to be put in place is the reason why we have such an eminent panel gracing this webinar i'm confident that their observations views advice suggestions will go a long way in addressing the matter at hand i wish this webinar a very best thank you very much and jai hind and now i request dr divakshi sharma to take over the proceedings of the interaction thank you so much sir so uh, now the house is open for discussion i would like to start by uh, a very simple question of the people before the pandemic also were facing uh, issues with their compulsion of session the now that we have pandemic here and uh, uh covid has uh, you know impacted everybody's life and it's here to stay for a little longer 
uh, um, what can we do to help those people who are already struggling with their obsession and compulsions? Because, you know, considering the situation, uh, we need to wash our hands and take necessary precautions also, uh, you know, so that we don't contract the virus. So, uh, what maybe uh, tips or, you know, strategies we can um, tell people and our audience? So, we would like to start with Dr. Shamshay. So, since COVID has had a very significant impact on our lifestyle and since mm -hmm. most of us are uh, homebound, there is a tendency when you are homebound or even when you are uh, enjoying a Sunday, there is a tendency to not follow a routine. Mm -hmm. you go out of routine. So, your circadian rhythm, etc. goes out of place. So, the first and the most important thing is that even when you are homebound, you must have a routine. That schedule of the day should not be disturbed. Otherwise, that will have an impact on the mental health. Because once you are occupied with routine that, okay, at 8 o'clock, I have to go for a walk. And at 9 in the morning, I will have my breakfast. And then I will read a book. And then I will watch a movie. The day will be planned in advance so that you don't have the empty mind is devil's workshop. So it is very important that you keep yourself occupied with a routine. If you don't have a routine, there are chances that you might drift into, uh, I would say, nothingness, and which can actually be detrimental for your physical as well as mental health. Dr. Rao, I think, will elaborate more on that. The second thing which I would just like to emphasize is that because most of the people are homebound, particularly elderly and those who are diabetic, having cardiopulmonary issues, for them, a uh, minimum, uh, as per the medical advice, they do need some physical exercise. Otherwise, their physical parameters can go awry. So, they need uh, mobility. So, the fear factor is real. That it is, we can't deny that there is a real threat of COVID to this particular subgroup of population. But they have to be... Uh, um, I think there has to be an advice, what are the precautions they take at the same time, they should uh, be allowed to, or they should be advised to go out and open and maintaining the social distancing norms, they can uh, very well enjoy their walk and uh, it can also have a de-stressing and a uh, good impact on the physical as well as mental health of the person. Dr. Murli, would you like to add something on that? Yeah, the the biggest thing that's going on is uh, like uh, it was very well laid out by Mr. Rajput and Dr. Vivedi. So in these times, everybody is facing uncertainty. Uncertainty is the biggest thing, and we are this COVID has exposed our healthcare system, our economic system and the whole thing. I mean, uh, your question uh, was about, what about increased um, uh, expression of mental illnesses in this, during this time? Mm -hmm. Yes, those who are already depressed, those who are already isolated, we are seeing increase in uh, depression, increase in uh, suicide, increase in substance abuse, and uh, like we never saw before, uh, like, for example, uh, my department has been the busiest throughout this period. I mean, uh, everybody is working at 125% their capacity. And uh, whereas other elective surgeries and everything has taken a back, back, you know, back seat, whereas the mental health issues are really at the forefront. If we just look at uh, our human psychology, we all want, uh, we know life is uncertain. We are, we know life is uh, going to end. Philosophically, we know uh, all this, but in reality, we crave for some kind of security and some kind of a certainty. So when that doesn't happen, then that leads to the sense of well-being being troubled. So automatically that gives rise to fear. So fear of unknown, what's going to happen? Fear is 
supposed to be the strongest emotion of the mankind. So the, because of fear, then there is anxieties and fear going hand in hand, and uh, the, you feel feel powerless and the, over the direction of your life, and that kind of drains you emotionally. And uh, uh, what if what if kind of spiral way of thinking uh, happens? So the you can go towards healthy adapt adaptation or unhealthy adaptation in a situation like this. The unhealthy ways are like, for example, you can only control what you can. So we try to lean more towards things that we can control in life. So hand washing, right? And uh, micromanaging everybody in the house and uh, giving to issues, tussle between family members. And uh, uh, because you have nothing else to do other than to keep your areas of control more active, because you don't want to look towards the uncertainty. That's, that's been the big problem. I think we should see the problem right in its face and uh, we should uh, gear our mindset to adopt to these fears and overcome that rather than denial and focusing on only what we can do. So this kind of reuse, you know, healthy amount of hand washing is wonderful to keep away the bugs, but somebody already has OCD tendencies, and for them, it, it, this takes away the whole thing. They will occupy the whole bathroom all day, washing the hands, not letting anybody else come in. And the same thing, depression causes isolation. And uh, now isolation, we are adding to the depression, and uh, it's really becoming more pronounced. Thank you. Very, very yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I would like to add on this, um, uh, you know, uh, for the OCD specific, uh, what I also suggest, and I'm sure the other panelists would agree, that the first thing that they need to start doing is limiting their exposure to over necessary news. Uh, because, you know, the, the news actually starts the triggering point of uh, creating a lot of unnecessary fears and, uh, uh, you know, uncertainty and anxiety. So I think that's the first thing that, you know, I would have in my mind where uh, I talk about OCD. I do have a client who, uh, you know, wakes up in, in 4 a.m. in the morning and start cleaning the house. So he cleans the house almost thrice in a day, the entire house with everything being sanitized. So, and secondly, if they are having a, you know, kind of a particular medications that they have, I will request and suggest them to continue their therapeutic interventions and do not break just because people are not able to go to clinic. There are a lot of virtual, uh, you know, therapists available. And of course, that uh, you know the the support from family is 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 indeed uh, one of you know has to increase at this time, uh, with especially with the people with the condition of OCD. So I think those are I think about it uh, in that manner for the OCD related specific uh, conditions. I can't. We can't hear you. I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, so, uh, Dr. Prakriti, since you run a helpline, Wellbeing Volunteers United through Pudar Foundation, so um, and with you know 50% of the labor, uh, you must be functional. But uh, I'm sure it must be really very tough. And what kinds of uh, questions and queries you must be getting? Uh, if you know, uh, you tell the audience about that would be very great. Well, thank you for asking this question. Um, a uh, it was not tough to get volunteers to come and join us. There were, you know, 700 of them came together in less than a week. And this is just with the collaboration of Rotary Club and a few, you know, YMCA and a few other clubs that came together to bring people on the platform. And everybody uh, was so motivated to be able to provide a service. We have um, Dr. Kersi Chavra, who was taking care of all the psychiatrists who came on board with us. We had um, uh, 27 uh, clinical psychologists as well as the volunteers who are all trained counselors themselves. Um, and uh, the calls, of course, uh, we intended that 
uh, we would handle distress calls from COVID, uh, situations that came out of COVID. Um, like uh, you know, Dr. Rao said, if it's uh, if it's a situation that is not in our locus of control, then we cannot you know fix it. So uh, <laughs> the pandemic is not in our control. The way in which we are reacting to the pandemic is in our control. So we made sure that all the people who are answering these calls were extremely well tuned to um, helping people realize what was in their control and what wasn't. Uh, we also found that a lot of people who had, if you're talking about people who have comorbidities, they actually went, um, they went into deeper isolation. Uh, their family members couldn't even get them out to interact with uh, each other. Um, people who, uh, if there were PMIs, people with mental health illnesses, uh, their family members started uh, calling a lot because there was a lot of violence that uh, started uh, taking place in their house, which is beyond others because you have to realize that people with uh, mental health illnesses have a structure that they like following. So even if you have a child with autism, there is a structure of the day, they have activities, all this was taken away. So we had a, we had cases that came up uh, where they didn't know how to deal with the violence that was uh, that they were that they were part of. Of course, we had a lot of um, intimate partner violence. Um, but this, unfortunately, we were hearing a lot more about it than the calls that were coming in because once again, you are stuck in small uh, spaces with the same people that are abusive towards you. It's very difficult to make that call. You have to find the space to make that call. Um, you know, there was, there were, of course, I can't tell you, 90% at least of people were between the ages of uh, 25 to 32 and going through what we would call um, an existential crisis. Because essentially, people at that age are really, and people at any age, I mean, the, the whole idea is that we are internally optimistic about the future. When you look at positive psychology, you're looking at a future, like future pacing, a positive reality. And now that's been taken away with this whole, uh, with the uncertainty of this pandemic. So what happens then is there's a lot of discontentment. It almost becomes like a dysphoria. So when people have a group, like a groomed dysphoria, you have, a lot of people in a state of flux with no uh, capability of reacting positively. So then we saw after that maladaptive practices, whether it be uh, consuming alcohol, uh, consuming, um, you know, consuming um, drugs, um, you know, or, or parents calling about the consumption of, of uh, hyper, uh, con a hyper consumption of the internet space, whether that be porn addiction, whether that be gaming, it, it was all happening. And uh, unfortunately, we haven't seen this go down. We haven't seen it go down yet. And I think it's actually getting worse because initially it was all about, uh, you know, what's going to happen? Can I get food? Can I get, you know, can I get my livelihood? What can we do? And then after that, it became, okay, this is getting over. And then you take, you know, the third phase and it's like, oh no, it's not getting over. What do we do? We're running out of, you know, so much, um, whether it be income, whether, and you know, all the generations, I'm not going to go into details because there's so many, you know, panelists here. I'd like uh, to let them speak. And, Every generation, whether it be Generation Z, whether it be the millennials, whether it be everybody's going through their own different um, albatross. They're all going through their own different burdens. And, and that different burden um, is reacting to them independent of what the circumstances are. But it reacts to with them in terms of their internal self, their, their communication with their loved ones, their family members, um, maybe the community, maybe their organization. All this information comes together to create their outlook towards the situation that they're in. And it hasn't been very supportive at this point, unfortunately, because we don't, all of us are battling an unknown, uh, an unknown danger. So it becomes an unknown battle and our reactions are always going to be fight or flight. And so, you know, we will continue in fight and flight and hopefully be the ones who can who can fight this rather than lose and fold. And if we can fold, there's support from doctors such as who we have on the panel. But it, but that is if they recognize that they're in fold. If they're just in flight, which we see a lot in the US where the, where, the, where the optimism bias comes in and they are like, okay, it's not going to affect us as much, but it affects everybody. 
And if we're not careful, and we believe that we're not careful, it's going to continue. So I think that um, the questions, like I said, that that came up and the, the burdens that people are carrying, I've already highlighted. And I, I think uh, that should answer your question. Yeah, thank you so much. Indeed, it did. It did answer my question very perfectly. And uh, moving on to Dr. Sparthi, I would like to, uh, you know, um, uh, gain insight more about uh, is working from home a stressor or more of a comfort for people, you know, because in the beginning it was like people were happy and we were getting to work from home and it's, uh, you know, in, in their comfort zone, so they were happy. But, uh, you know, as time passed by, they started to, you know, worry about their, uh, uh, their occupation and the professional front. So, what would you like to say about that? Uh, a very interesting question, Dr. Devakji. Um, so, while I'm working with a lot of corporates, um, and I did observe that uh, in the beginning, everyone, you know, was really comfortable because everybody thought that, you know, it's going to bring a work life balance and it's going to create. Uh, you know, I, what I talk about, you know, like a teamwork, the family works together. So I call that as a fam work, uh, right? So everybody thought that, you know, everything will be, you know, better, nicer, no traffics on the roads and uh, very smooth uh, life going to be while working from home. Uh, but indeed, it, it did happen for, you know, the first three months. And I think uh, it was around first one and a half or two months. It was absolutely smooth. But why, you know, we all understand. And I think uh, for me, uh, when I look at people for corporates and employees uh, while they're working at home, and I think the lockdown has become the biggest teacher of all. Uh, because there are so many things that people are learning while they are under lockdown. And uh, not just that, uh, you know, they are um, uh, one, of course, I'd say that fam work, the families have started working together, the males and the females are sharing responsibilities, uh, the children also understanding the responsibility. And of course, you know, they are trying to manage the work, the family and the kids time and the time with the parents. So I think they have created a kind of a balance and trying level best to create a balance. However, now the later part of the lockdown when the lockdown is still you know yet you know partially open and partially closed uh, i see there is a lot of demand coming back from employees to join back their offices uh one because of course they and here we actually feel that what is the role of social wellness plays a very big role indeed we are social animals and we can't stay stranded at homes with just four or five people you know, while they go to the offices, there is, as you know, very correctly said by Dr. Devedi, it is a routine that, you know, it should not be disturbed. So the routine earlier, which used to be getting ready, getting up on a particular time, going to office, uh, you know, meeting few people, a lot of time is being taken and brought from home for all the meetings. So there's the time that actually a human was actually devoting in workplaces. I see those timings increasing not just limited to nine hours or eight hours, it being extended uh, to, you know, 11 hours or 12 hours, in fact. So there is, yes, there is, uh, initially, I see the trend moving towards acceptance of work from home. However, later part uh, is, you know, kind of defining it as people want to go back and, or, you know, have more a balanced and uh, you know comfortable life while they were working from offices. So I think it's both ways. It it completely depends on individual what they feel, uh, you know, and how they are balancing during the lockdown. So it's uh, it's both ways. However, yeah, the trends have been uh, you know in in both the categories. All right, all right. Uh, so uh, moving on, I guess uh, for older generation, for older people who are living uh, in the comfort zones but they cannot move out because their movements are restricted. Uh, and I'm talking specifically about people uh, diagnosed with dementia. And I'm sure Dr. Uh, Devaiti and Dr. Muli uh, must be having a lot of things to say about it. Uh, so, uh, you know, dealing with a dementia patient is itself a very difficult task. But uh, during this pandemic, uh, their movements are also restricted. They cannot move out of their houses uh, and, you know, walk because walking and physical exercise is important in the part of the routine. So uh, how can, you know, caregivers also manage their own burden and also caregivers, you know, can deal with the people, uh, uh, you know, uh, they are having in their houses with dementia? 
So, um, so go ahead. Yeah. yeah, please go ahead. I will give my observation later later because there are certain Delhi specific observation re related to the impact of COVID on the health of the population here, particularly the geriatric group. But I will talk later. Please, Dr. Rao, go ahead. Well, um, if you look at the uh, calamity done by this COVID, it uh, unfortunately is the elderly. Uh, the the World Health Organization statistics uh, early during the course of the disease showed that 95% uh, of people who died out of COVID were over the age of 60, and 50% uh, of them were over the age of 80. So if you look at the uh, most common form of dementia being Alzheimer's disease, it uh, affects about one in seven at the age of 65, and uh, it becomes like almost like one in two or three by the age of 85. So it's a steep uh, increase between 65 and 85. So that's the same vulnerable population who as their cognitive impairment progresses or deteriorates, um, of course, they are at the hands of others, at the mercy of others, the caregivers. Now, how do you prevent uh, the traffic of people coming in and out in an elderly care home, or even an elderly person in the house, right? Somebody has to lift them, somebody has to uh, clean them, somebody have to change their diapers, feed them. So you have to come into close proximity. And that's the person who's the caregiver who goes to the outside world and comes back. He, so the only source of uh, infection possible in that situation is the person who has, goes in and out. And it happens in three shifts. So that means change of personnel. So many people are involved to take care of one elderly Handicap with cognitive deficits and physical deficits takes number of people. So they are automatically cannot be protected. Um, and therefore, they took the real brunt of this pandemic is on the elderly and those who are isolated, living alone, and uh, are living at the mercy of help from the community. And uh, now the, what community is doing is they are staying away from them. So they're becoming even more isolated and uh, they're not being cared for. So in, in the best interest of protecting the elderly, their own children don't go to see them. We're saying that, I don't want to bring infections to you, but that causes more loneliness. So we have to be very cognizant of all these things so that we should recognize if you see somebody lonely, somebody living in a situation, I think that's where the volunteer work is, should play a bigger hand to call them, to talk to them, to teach them about iPad and give them those things so that they feel like they're in the community because our human brains are wired to be uh, in society, connecting with other people. And uh, so it, it, this COVID has taken that away. So it particularly affects the elderly. Now, as far as Delhi is concerned, there are a few uh, interesting uh, facts that I would like to share with you. One is that, uh, sorry, phone wasn't on silent. So one of them is that when the COVID broke out, uh, we all, the doctors that we interact with each other, we were all at home and we were talking on social media or telephone and we were thinking what would happen to the patients who would come to the casualty because the availability of doctor was a challenge. But uh, to our surprise, and I, share, I asked my cardiology colleagues as well as other neurologists, that the incidence of cardiopulmonary emergencies as well as stroke was much less. And I would say much, when I say much, it was reduced by more than 
uh, in the casualties. So we thought that maybe it is because of the fear of COVID that the patients are not reporting. But even the death register of the city revealed that the incidence of deaths due to other causes, particularly road traffic accidents, heart attacks, which is myocardial infarction, stroke, etc., all reduced. So we have to really introspect. This is also introspection time that what do we do in our so-called normal routine, which leads to increased mortality and morbidity because of cardiopulmonary diseases. Maybe when uh, the best care that we have, uh, we, we got in Delhi in last so many years was during the COVID times. It was, there was less pollution, less traffic, less road stress, road rage. So I think there was a, a significant, though COVID was a killer, but the overall mortality was not very high. And in fact, it was less. So the lesson is that it was a natural experiment which happened with us in Delhi. And that made us realize that there are many things in our so-called normal living which, are, which is actually aggravating our uh, uh, diseases and uh, causing more mortality. So we have to really do that introspection also, a study of that data, which is there uh, in the register. Because Delhi has a fairly good uh, track of the number of deaths that we have in a day and also the cause of death because uh, unlike many other parts of the uh, of india but the second thing which i realized was although um, because of lack of mobility initially many of the elderly they had a, a difficulty those who were suffering from dementia because they were homebound and many of them used to become very aggressive and unreasonable with the family members but on the other hand let me tell you most of the people in delhi and particularly in places like gurgaon they have nuclear family uh, parents are elderly both the husband and the wife they are the couple is going to work there is nobody to take care of the elderly at home uh, many of the patients, uh, they reported, uh, the family reported that maybe the care was better because everybody was working from home. So there were more people to take care of the elderly at home. So many of my dementia patients, particularly from Gurgaon, they reported that their parents who were suffering from dementia, they were faring better because they were seeing, seeing more of their family members, kith and kin, and caregivers are never a replacement for the family members. So there is a flip side to everything. So I would say that we have, this is a time to introspect also that what all we should do in our daily living so that the mortality statistics of the city improves. COVID has created a natural experiment where we had a very laid back lifestyle, less traffic, less stress, less of rage, less of adrenaline surge, which happens during the so-called normal living which adds to the burden of uh, cardiovascular deaths. So this needs to be introspected. The other things which Dr. Murli said, I agree with it, but I was wanting to give the flip side of the whole story. Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of things here because, uh, because uh, India, we take India, care of... We take care of uh, I'm getting my own echo. Uh, so the joint family system, for the elderly uh, in India, you know, you, they are homebound together with the family. Uh, here in the Western society, they are they live separately, and now they are not, don't have visitors. So it's other other kind of a thing happening. Um, the unattended deaths for number of medical causes, not COVID related, uh, used to be. Uh, 2030 like that in the Chicago land where I live and uh, now it has increased by about 10 times because people live alone and uh, they are not seeking help and uh, they uh, for the fear of COVID and they are watching TV living alone and getting scared and uh, even when they have to go out to get help they are avoiding and uh, that clearly showed in about 10 fold increase in the unattended isolated deaths in those who are living alone 
Um, so it's very important to keep track of those who are living alone because the, many of them were found two or three days later uh, when the mailman came and said the mail still has not been picked up and the parcel has not been picked up only that kind of attention they got um, so it can go both ways um, the, 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 i think the india is uh, uh, fortunate because you have community system close living it's you it cannot be out of sight of somebody for too long <laughs> that's a, a advantage and the others other statistic that really is impressive is uh, the even though the rates of covid infection a number of people testing positive is uh, higher in India, getting higher and higher. But at the same time, like we were discussing before this, uh, Dr. Duedi and all, uh, the 20 to 30 percent have already developed herd immunity. And uh, in Dharavi, it was like 40 percent that I read. And uh, that's fantastic. And uh, like we were talking about the statistics, when it reaches 60 percent, then it is manageable. And uh, until then, the gradual exposure that's been happening that's the that was the effect of quarantine so quarantine has helped slow down the hospitalization hospital bed utilization and the demand for the personal protective gear and that's the advantage um, so i think the mortality rate in india is astoundingly the lowest compared to many countries uh, it's like uh, here it was like uh, three per hundred thousand, and in India it was like 0 0.03 per hundred thousand. That's uh, phenomenal. I think now people beginning to we understand the importance of herd immunity. I mean, that's the only thing that can explain this phenomena before vaccine has come. So that's good news, uh, and. Uh, yeah, that's that's about the elderly. Uh, not only their physical health, mental health, but elderly with dementia. We discussed all the three groups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, very true. I agree because uh, I also working as a clinical psychologist, <laughs> clinical psychologist uh, with mindful TMS. Uh, I've also seen um, after pandemic when people were allowed to move out of the houses, um, people uh, started visiting with complaints like i lack motivation i don't want uh, you know don't feel like getting up and those uh, you know anxiety bouts and also mood uh, sadness and uh, some bouts of uh, depression they were actually exhibiting and they actually were very prominent um, uh, in Delhi NCR, I can say specifically. Uh, so moving up, moving on to uh, you know couples living together who uh, have been you know stuck uh, in their own houses or maybe quarantined. Uh, uh, how do they uh, you know bifurcate and take the me time from the we time? Because now they're living together, uh, it's good obviously to spend time with your spouse and. Uh, uh, you know the, the best time to clear out some misunderstandings, misunderstandings. But also, you know, taking some me time out of that we time is also very important. So, what do you have to say about that? Well, you know, the work from home situation has really destroyed the boundaries. Uh, you know, there was a time when you get up, get dressed, and go to workplace either you drive or take a public transportation so it that travel time was giving you a clear break for your mind to shift from home mode to work mode and similarly when you're coming back home you are able to pre prepare yourself for thinking about home um, spouses children what plan i had to do so your mind would be planning this way and you're going to work you're planning the other way so there was a clear boundaries now with the work from home whether the one spouse is working at between four and eleven, the other one is working with eight and three. In between, there are children. In between, they have to prepare food. So it's all messed up. I mean, that's where I think uh, our, those who have organized very well do very well, but majority of them are not organized. I mean, uh, the, the the child is asking for help, and the uh, dad says, "I am at work," and then uh, my mother is at work. So you don't know because it's all mixed up i think uh, uh, sorting out that 
uh, is what people are missing. No wonder they are ready to get out and see uh, one more time some organized way of living. Yeah, I, I actually agree. Uh, we do a lot of work with couples and uh, most of uh, most people uh, have never established their personal boundaries and relationships in India um, because there's never been a conversation around that and we've never been trained to actually have those conversations. Um, and when this, you know, pandemic really came forward, um, even the working women were put in roles of, of going back to our uh, archaic sort of understanding of the labels. And uh, what happened with that was um, that women started getting resentful that they weren't being understood that you know they were also at work. And uh, Dr. Rao, you pointed it out perfectly. They had never had an open conversation about their personal bill of rights, their own needs. Um, they had never spoken to their spouses about this is the time that I need to be doing my work. And when I do this, you need to man up and take care of the children. You need to be able to do A, B, C, D things. I don't, I think it's very few people uh, that actually have the courage to do that. And this is not only the women, but it's also the men. The men also kind of felt obligated to, to pretend to be there, but having never actually done that, had really no idea what they were getting into. So the domestic fights were based around, you know, why aren't you, aren't you capable? Like, can you not see you're running a whole organization? You're not able to <laughs> handle this. And then you take the ones that are able to handle this. Right. But they're also handling. And like you said, there's a family system. There is a joint family system. So you're not only taking care of your immediate nuclear family, but you are also keeping up with the entire system. And in that system, you still have to play a part. And we have never been taught. And I, I say this a lot because I find it almost humorous. How ever since we were kids, we were we've always been taught to put another person before ourselves. Um, we've always been taught that even even when we're eating and and you know we're we're, eat, we're on the dining table and we say we're full, we're told we're not full and we have to eat more because we haven't eaten enough. I mean, you start from that simple premise of the fact that we are told from a young age that we have no idea what we're talking about and that we uh, that the elders know better and that you have to respect other people and so you've never actually, which I think is great because it's it's fantastic that we do that, but. At some point, we've lost ourselves. And I, I know when we do therapy for people, at 40, they're still asking their parents about what decisions they should make financially or what decisions they could make, they should make emotionally. And it is a, a very divorced from what reality of that age seems like. So when you get in a situation now that you're together the whole time, gaps start to come up. I've had people call me and say, you know, I never realized that my spouse and I were not on the same page. I didn't realize that our, our belief systems were not matching because you've never spent time actually having those conversations. In one year, you're forced into having children. Then you kind of groom these children and, and you nurture these children. Life becomes about the children. It's not about you as a couple. Coupledom is not taken seriously in our, uh, in our systems. It's all about the family. So, um, you know, it's, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a surprise that, uh, you know, the system of, of marriages have collapsed and also, what I have noticed is that uh, there is a large population of entitled people that actually get their relationship needs met outside of the marriage. And there's been a huge amount of dis disharmony because of that, because they're obviously now being forced into lockdown. Both parties are being forced into lockdown. Women are calling also about the fact that, you know, we don't even have space to talk to our friends anymore. So it's it's all around a, diff a difficult situation. And I think after four months, people kind of get used to it. And now it's easing up. Uh, but it was really difficult for the first three months. It was like, you know, pushing against the grain. So, um, like I said, there was a lot of intimate uh, partner violence. There was a lot of emotional abuse. There was a lot of, um, obviously, domestic violence comes in. And uh, just overall, a collapse in the systems. It will be interesting study to see uh, in 2021 and 2022, the rates of marriage will go up or down. Yes. <laughs> after having witnessed what goes on in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Very true, very true, and very rightly said, Dr. Prakriti. Uh, uh, and I'm sure Dr. Swati must be having a lot of things to talk about, you know, from the uh, professional front uh, through in the context of corporate, because, uh, you know, both the parties are working, females and males, uh, in the house. 
and they're working from home right now in the current situation. So, um, uh, you know, because uh, I, uh, Mindful TMS also as an organization which I'm coming from, uh, we also try to help different, uh, you know, people coming from different areas, uh, you know, couples and uh, uh, different symptoms also. But, you know, uh, it's not easy because for females, uh, uh, you know, I can talk from personal experience. They have added burden if uh, you know uh, the responsibilities are being shared. I think that's well and good. But uh, apart from that, also you know the corporate burden is there, the, and the professional, and the personal, and the family burden, all of that is there. So how do you? Uh, I mean, how do organizations you know help those females and males? You know, both of them. So. Um... She, what I understand, you know, from the corporate sector. So first, I would definitely would like to add on to the previous, uh, you know, question that was on the family and the relationship issues. And uh, you know, so I had in my course of like three last three four months in the COVID situations. So one, of course, I see there is a lot of friction among couples. But on the other hand, I also saw couples uh, who wanted to separate actually have come together because they are actually locked down into a same house and they understood the meaning of real life where they felt that what in case the life ends what is you know then i mean you know they are realizing the fact that the current partner is is, is good enough or they started you know collaborating together so i again see two aspects of everything in covid uh, one definitely you know having those frictions but the other side i have personally uh, you know, coach two, two couples, uh, you know, and they are absolutely getting together now and they have actually moved ahead and coming together and realizing the fact that this is, uh, you know, uh, interesting time where people are realizing their internal emotions. And now coming back to, and you know, I always say uh, to all of, you know, the people who have, uh, you know, have various things to do and where both uh, male and the female uh, are working, always tell them account your day the way we account our money we have to account on our energies we have to account on our time that we have in our hand so of course you have certain eight to nine hours of you know working hours you need to spend at least one hour in a day with entire family you also need to spend some time as a couple together it's extremely important and of course the me time, the 30 minutes to 35 minutes of the me time, that is something extremely important. Uh, moving on to the corporates, how corporates are doing, I think uh, for the corporates, they are understanding and an empathic leadership uh, is now has taken up a step ahead in corporates where a leader has to understand what the you know the families and the you know their employees are going through so for example very correctly said by dr divedi when he, he said that you know uh, people living with a mental health conditions in a family a person with a mental condition for them it, it's truly in india it's it's like a you know it's like a blessing to have working from home and employees are being you know, supported by organizations so I think in corporates, it's a lot of corporates have started, uh, you know, coaching leadership on empathy, not just, you know, because they, they need to understand what the employees are going through. Employee would definitely, you know, go two steps ahead to make things better in the working areas. But I think the fact that a leader uh, as an organization, of course, but as a leader, the first leader needs to, you know, uh, impart something like an empathic leadership where they understand what the employees are going through at uh, during this tough time and of course uh, you know how they are managing in case they know they need the, those two hours to be replaced by another two hours where the wife is working and the husband wants uh, you know time off to take care of the kids or his studies that is where you know that that leadership would come in and step in and would act as a mediator where they understand the fact that employees and and i also see that you know this is this time and the kind of support that organizations are giving towards employees and understanding these facts will definitely going to strengthen the relationship between the employees and the employer this is the time this is the time that the organization and the companies needs to understand 
that this is the time that they need to support the employees and of course the employees to understand the needs that the organization also do. So it's going to go in hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I guess uh, this must be a great help to the audience here. Uh, so we have a few questions from the participants. I would like to take them also. Um, uh, you know, as far as children are also concerned uh, in this uh, COVID situation, uh, they are very addicted to, you know, mobiles and gaming uh, all throughout the day. So, uh, you know, taking care of children who are doing online classes and taking online classes uh, at home, how do we manage that, uh, you know, as a parent? So can I, can I chime in for this one? I have... Yeah, sure. uh, I have three of my own kids and I'm battling that every day. So I have a 14 year old, a 12 year old and a eight year old. And uh, because the classes are online um, and they have to be online for those classes, um, again, uh, you know, talking about uh, putting those boundaries in place and allowing them, just, you know, the, the time that they have for their school, which is going to be online, but also allowing them two hours of, of free play. Uh, which is online uh, does not cause a fight but if you take it away and you say okay you only have time to be online for uh, the school time and after that no more uh, gaming no more getting on your ipads and all that then you have to be ready to be doing things with your children you have to be ready to actually uh, get down on the floor with them and activate being a parent that is fully involved and unfortunately i mean even for me uh, again talking about the the bias that people have towards uh, uh, the working woman and the working man. Uh, my kids still, my kids will question my work hours. They will question it. They won't question my husband's work hours. And this is not talk to them. We're, we're you know, we're all independent, like very open family, right? But they will still question. But more, you like your work more than you like us. And and why is it that you're working when you can play with us? So if you have all the time in the world uh, to really spend involved with them then you do that otherwise you make it a joint conversation and that is true for any parenting you make it a joint conversation use the i word saying i find it extremely uh you know upsetting when you are on um, you know, your gaming device for the whole day. Uh, so what is it that we can do to come up with a solution? So you have a very solution focused conversation, which is open. You talk about the fact that you feel a certain way about the situation, but the community, which is your family, has to come up with a solution. Let them build that solution. And I found that this is how it's worked for me, uh, apart from the fact that we do parenting as well. But um, this works like magic because they are part of the solution. So they're, you're not always looking at them and talking to them as though they have the problem. Because unless you can give the solution of being involved on a regular basis completely 100% of the time, or you give them options of what to do, you can't be dictatorial anymore with kids nowadays. You have to make sure that they are part of the conversation. And so then I've had people say, yeah, but my kid's only three years old. Yeah, or my kid's only four years old. Why do they have a gadget then? Whose problem is that? If your kid is only three or four years old right and if the kid is eight years old you can have an intelligent conversation so then there's no excuse then the excuse is really just to trigger you to look inward to see what are the problems that you have in this parenting situation and why can't you put your boundaries in place so that your child can then uh, cater to those boundaries by having those open conversations with your children very true very true thank you thank you so much uh, second question we have from Dr. Sharma. Uh, all the financial uncer uncertainty this you know pandemic has brought uh, in, and uh, the impact on the job front, people are losing jobs. Uh, so uh, you know, um, people are uh, going through a phase of sad mood and anxiety. You know, and they're you know when they anticipate the future, it seems uh, gloomy and dark, and they don't know if they'll be able to make it to the next month. You know, paying bills. You know, practically speaking, uh, they have to pay the bills, take care of the children, they have a family to take care of. So, uh, how do we deal with deal with that? Okay, let me take that question since it's from the uh, corporate se sector and uh, job anxieties. 
Um, yes, I, I I agree with uh, you know the sir was asked this question because uh, this is a very relevant question for this time indeed uh, because uh, there are a lot of organizations uh, where where people are losing jobs. Uh, so the first and the foremost thing that we need to understand in that is uh, I truly understand and I I am not taking side of the organizations. But there are no organization who wants to close down. Let's understand that first, right? Every organization, every organization wants to expand, right? And wants to grow. Nobody wants to, you know, shut down. So for, uh, you know, the difficult it is for the employee, it is even harder for organization to ask their employees to move on. So in that phase, one, the first and foremost is to understand, accept the reality and the facts that this may be a condition of uh, which we may face in future. So in that case, I will suggest uh, people to first accept the reality. Second, uh, understand what are their strengths and weaknesses. Keep their skills updated. Understand what is the another level or another set of our uh, jobs they can look forward to uh, i'm sure we all have all individuals have not just one skill and i'm sure we all have multiple skills and multiple opportunity to you know uh, earn a bread for our houses right so i would suggest them to think about list down what are the things that they can do during the pandemic and what are the areas that they can work for they should explore uh, even if they, you know, have to go and turn a little way outside their own current jobs, maybe a different job, they can explore lots and lots of other uh, job opportunities. And also just to reiterate, there are many organizations who have the portals where they are helping out people who are unemployed or have lost the jobs. So uh, I think government also doing a lot of efforts in that and trying and building on their support. And fourth, of course, that every one of us, uh, ideally in this situation, should have some uh, support and help from uh, mental health experts. Uh, where I know this is going to like a breakdown, but to balance yourself and to help bounce back, you definitely need an expert. Uh, and I'm sure Dr. Kodar will definitely top up on this and of, of her views of the people that are you know coming to. Uh, her purview and you know seeking help in this uh, so i think these are the three four things for the people who are you know going through this kind of a turmoil uh, of of losing jobs yeah i think um, swati you hit the nail on the head i think uh, the key thing when you are going through a situation which is causing you distress is to really ask yourself do you have control over it do you have control? A, we do not have control over this pandemic. Do you have control over how your corporate is going to be reacting to the situation or to the financial? Uh, I mean, to the financial blueprint of the organization, whether they have the capacity to, you know, to ride this storm. Uh, you do not have control over that. The only thing that your investigation of what you have control over will bring you to is that. You only have control over your thoughts, your actions, your feelings, your behaviors, and your own anxieties. And all this has a positive as well, since you have control over how you respond to the situation. What happens in a situation like this is we are all reactive and therefore we get into a hypervigilance, we get into a negative spiral and a looping of negativity, which is completely uh, accurate given the environment that we're in right now. So. Unfortunately, that accurate response, uh, or sorry, that accurate reaction can be turned into a response by slowing down. So a lot of the times when we talk about well-being, we talk about the verticals of well-being, which is basically your mindset, your physical health, your nutritional health, your uh, spiritual health, your um, your financial well-being, as well as uh, as well as your recovery, which is your sleep essentially and when you have um, something out of control uh, it's best to hook onto something that you can control so this situation is out of control but can you control the things that are in your control can you control your mindset by you know incorporating breathing techniques uh, slowing down when you feel um, extremely anxious when you check with your body uh, whether it's go it's reacting 
uh, to the anxiety? Are the palpitations increasing? Is your is your hand getting sweaty? Are you getting dizzy? Look at the signs and the symptoms that are getting displayed. Once you actually understand that those signs and symptoms are getting displayed, ask yourself, is it positive for you to feel like this or should you do something to stop this feeling from catastrophizing? The answer is obviously going to be, yes, I should do something. So you invoke the breathing. Start involving yourself in good eating habits, exercise. Because exercise, and you know, the doctors here will tell you what exercise does to your body, what that what exercise does to your mind, and how that impacts your feelings of well-being. So what you have in control is which which is these practices, actually utilize them as tools to start beginning to feel better. And as Swati said, maybe look around for new skills that you want to harness in your life. Of course, this is not easy when you are feeling demotivated, but, and it is not easy even to get healthy eating habits or healthy sleeping habits. But like I say, wherever I go, don't manage or try to manage stress. It's not a relationship that you want to maintain. You have to get to fighting it. You have to get to actually actively working on a solution to feel healthy and happy so that you can combat the stressful situation in a, in a better manner. I think that's what I have as an input to you know that question. Absolutely. I, One suggestion. I think Dr. Podar clearly outlined what, what is the way to rebuild your resiliency is this is the opposite of stress and anxiety. We're talking about stress, whether it's job related, family related, finance related, any kind of stress that causes anxiety. So the counter of stress and anxiety is uh, uh, developing resiliency. It's not like that. It's not possible. So, so certain things one should not do is to not to focus on the negatives not to focus on the things out of your control, like Dr. Poddar very clearly said. So focus on things in your control, then try to don't isolate yourself. In spite of all the uh, anguishes that you go through, you keep your mm -hmm. persistence, keep your uh, endurance to see through that you manage your interpersonal relationship, you devote enough time for yourself, um, the, the, the famous uh, Dr. Lake's uh, four pillars of mental health are one is to sleep adequately, one is to uh, regular physical activity, don't uh, cut down on the physical activity. And then of course, healthy nutrition, you can get about uh, 20 million. <laughs> you can search for healthy nutrition, you get all kinds of advice. And then uh, stress management. Everybody has to find out from their past experience. Everybody has gone through some stresses. Everybody has gone through some losses. And how they manage it, have a memory of that, and try to expand on it. Because that's very important. Whether it be meditation, whether it be religion thing, where practice or a spiritual practice, doesn't matter. See what works for you. And then keep that as a tool for emergencies. Like breathing is the simplest and the easiest thing to do. Just in spite of any situation, if you close your door and just spend five minutes focusing on your breathing, it gives comfort to anybody in any situation. So things like that, you know, whatever works for you, keep that in mind, take care of yourself, and um, then you can take care of others. So that's the best I could say. That's One another. suggestion, when you are going through such a phase when somebody has lost a job, uh, one suggestion is not to stay and brood alone. Uh, go and meet your wise friends and try to be in a company and don't just sit alone and keep thinking about it. Absolutely. Be with friends whom you consider financially and otherwise wise. And finally, you will find that they are the people who will give you the way how to go about it. So... Staying alone uh, when you lost a job is a recipe for disaster. You will, you because your mind will focus on all the negative things which can happen, whereas a wise friend will pull you out of it. Uh, in, uh, and and no professional can replace a wise friend. And you know, you are not the only one who lost the job or had a cut in pay. There are literally thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who went through that. So mingling with those 
friends and see how they are dealing with learning from one another. And like Dr. Chawla pointed out, uh, it's, we are not born for a single job. We are capable of adapting to other jobs. So we, we have to be flexible to change our mindset. This is not the only one and only job I can do. You look at your skill set, develop others. So because things are rapidly changing, you know, the jobs that used to be common in the past are not the jobs today and will not be the jobs of the future. So keep that mindset open and then uh, adopt to whatever that comes to you. And that, that attitude to develop and to develop a healthy group of friends where these things can be openly talked about. I think I want to I want to emphasize what Dr. Grady also said because we've seen a lot of suicidal ideation taking place with this kind of you know job stress, um, and I think that's really important. Uh, uh, is definitely do not spend time alone when you are feeling uh, depressed, and do not wait to think about whether you need a therapist at this point or not. Reach out to the distress helplines if you are even feeling slightly uncomfortable with the situation, so that you can be held by people. There is no need to spend time alone. There are experts who are waiting for you on various helplines, including Nim Hands. Um, I think Ibas has one, uh, of course. You know, a lot of um, the well being volunteers is there. There's a lot of people who started helplines. Reach out to them. There is no need to feel um, apprehensive alone because the flip of a switch is quite instantaneous. And you don't need to be, uh, you know, going through that. And also recognize if you've ever had, if you've ever had symptoms of, of feeling negative and that catastrophizing, do not wait for that to happen. Just take the, the, the environment as a trigger and say that this could happen because the environment is similar. But do not do not wait for it to catastrophize in your own mind. If there is even a slight, like if you know, people who have headaches can take a crocin, or you can wait for the migraine to attack you. I mean, just go for the slight headache and, and relax and talk to somebody who is a professional as well. I just want to add one more thing that is this is something Dr. Podar said that one has to do for themselves. But if you are so depressed, down and out, that you cannot pull yourself to do that, if you see that in your family, if you see it in your friends, please go and look for them and offer your help. You don't have to be professionals. It could be anybody with a good, kind heart don't be uh, judgmental. Don't uh, poke them to come out, tell me what's going on. Just be with them. Just be with them. And when you think it's a crisis, get them professional help. When it's not a crisis, then get them regular kinds of interventions. But be with them. If you see somebody alone, it's, it's uh, all our responsibility, whether it's a family member or a colleague at work or anybody that we know in our friend circle. We, we tend to go away from them because he's not fitting into our mold, right? It should be other way around. In the times like this, one should be careful that, that, that this same quiet person tomorrow who could be, God forbid, commit suicide. So we should be there, you know, putting our arms around the person and say, I'm with you. Just give that message. You don't have to, no question answer. Silence is good. Silence is wonderful, but be with them. Mm -hmm. I will also just suggest for the corporates and the organizations before they they know you know every organization know who's gonna you know close down or ramp down or uh, you know as they say so I would suggest every organization and corporates to actually in fact have all every I, I believe personally believe that all organizations should have tie-ups with organizations who are providing counseling services who are uh, you know those helpline numbers are extremely critical for all the organization to have a tie up with, uh, especially in this condition. And if they know they're going to ramp down with their businesses, uh, they should actually provide a, a, a set of counseling and coaching before uh, for each individual before they, you know, kind of uh, disclose this kind of information to them. It should it has to be a very planned manner so that uh, they, they need to prepare the employee rather than just, uh, you know, kind of affecting their, uh, uh, shocking them with the news. All right, all right. So, uh, um, 
they quickly taking on a few you know psycho psychological first aid tips for people and for audience who are watching uh, because uh, for any you know injury or uh, cut you have a uh, physical first aid but uh, during the uh, times in covid 19 pandemic uh, people cannot visit people have this fear that they don't want to visit hospitals and something you know some strategies and some tips they can do at their homes to you know uh, help their family member or maybe their friends so uh, some psychological first aid tips you know quickly uh, for the audience so we can start with dr uh, dibedi as i said right at the beginning that uh, don't leave your routine this is the time to learn new things if you are homebound don't waste your time do some value addition in your life you, because this is the time when you can do many things which you thought that you can do and you want to do but you couldn't do because you had no time it could be a hobby it could be a value addition in your profession learning a new technique people who are into say software uh software professionals they can learn new things new codings etc which will help them professionally when the economy bounces back they will be better equipped to get a job so this is the time to introspect this is a time to rest and this is a time to learn and all this can happen once you have a daily schedule if don't go out of your daily routine don't don't just start getting late up in the morning and then waste your time while your time just keep brooding keep thinking don't give yourself time to think negative and that can happen only when you have a daily schedule in place dr rao quickly some tips for the audience yeah, i am not trying to pitch my own book uh, but uh, national network of depression centers in india headquartered in delhi which has 100 volunteers have signed up psychologists to offer their free services so one could easily contact them so to uh, since the purpose of the organization is to improve mental health awareness so i have uh, prepared several books uh, one is for the trainer and the trainee so this is for a, 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 a anyone can do this it's not there's no technical jargon in it the, 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 how to recognize some of the signs and symptoms of mental illnesses how to be aware of that and how to approach a person uh, when they are in so I've given some mnemonics so just like you have abc for cpr if somebody faints in front of you you know you clear the airway check their breathing and count the pulse right similarly in mental health also if you see somebody a, acting differently that you knew was different before and uh, from the baseline that they're deviating a lot there are ways to approach so i've used the mnemonic game plan and each letter stands for something you can do so you will know when to assess and when to uh, non-judgmental and when to take them to professionals when they're in crisis how to identify a crisis very simply written for everyone uh, it's called 50 plus and healthy but there are many training modules that's available through NDC. There will be training volunteers to train others, and they did it in several villages in uh, in, in uh, Haryana already, and with a good success through Ramakrishna. There are a number of opportunities now that the whole group has come together in this crisis. So now they are given the tools that anybody can read and teach others and learn for themselves. Um, so the, even though it's called 50 plus and healthy, uh, it's available on uh, Amazon, but it's good for anybody to read. Uh, it it's, uh, simply says what all the steps anybody can take when there's somebody in crisis, somebody seems depressed, withdrawn, or behaving differently. So what are the steps you can take? Dr. Prakriti? Um, if I was to end with, uh, I, I like what Viktor Frankl said uh, once. He said he wrote uh, where he said, "If anybody, if people know the why, then they can handle anyhow." And I think that that's really important. You know, live purposefully is important. Um, adopt a growth mindset, which means that you know, like be present in your day, like understand the kind of uh, uh, 
understand the purpose. Understand that you know uh, there there is a standard for you to maintain. I think I think what Dr. Devedi said also is very important. Uh, maintain that schedule. Have a schedule. Wake up. Get ready like you would if you were even going to office. I find that a lot of people who wake up. Uh, and they're at home. They don't actually bother really getting ready, um, and and they don't get, they don't bother getting ready the way they would if they were going out and interacting with people. I think that's really essential. Uh, prioritize, prioritize the things that you need to do. Use the 80-20 Pareto principle rule. Uh, get the stuff done that would give you the most amount of satisfaction. Uh, make sure, of course, like I said before. Uh, healthy eating if you can afford it uh, but even if you can't afford it this there there are options of healthy eating um definitely healthy sleeping uh you know try to avoid um you know a lot of caffeine in the evening because you need to be able to sleep and like uh, uh dr chabla also said people are working longer hours in fact the hours are getting merged in so so we have to make sure that we maintain those standards and we adopting this growth mindset would really help people understand the key uh, of their of their well-being, which is their net worth is not their self-worth. And once I think once they actually see this and they actually build this in themselves, they'll recognize that they are more than what they claimed to be. And I think that will allow for the adaptive sort of uh, methods to feel better and the adaptive sort of mindfulness practices that can take them into uh, a positive uh, frame of mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and for me, I think uh, for a psychological first aid, and the you know one of the, the things that we need to follow during COVID is, of course, as uh, almost everyone has spoken about, very appropriate uh, situations and suggestions that needs to be followed. For me, I will just add on to it that until unless I am aware of how I feel, uh, it will be difficult for figure out that what I need. Right, and to be a self-aware of what I am feeling because it is up to me whether uh, if you know the mind is very you know complicated and it always think very negative before positive, right? So uh, we need to control our thoughts. So I I say don't let your thought control you. You control your thoughts. And how you can control your thought is by getting more and more aware of what are you thinking. And that awareness will only come when you start, I strongly feel when you start meditating and uh, you know, uh, using mindfulness, the moment you become aware of how I feel, what I'm feeling, only then you can take a second step of correcting it. So for me, the mantra has always been, one, uh, control your thoughts, do meditation, be self-aware or for yourself and for the others in your family and colleagues and everyone. Understand, have knowledge of what is other signs and symptoms, very correctly said by Dr. Rao. Need to be aware of what is exactly the signs and symptoms and what is the time that I need to look for a medical help. Third is, uh, you know, about being socially fit, uh, you know, this isolation has become a very big thing in the COVID. And I think the more you socialize, uh, the more you get uh, very, very, you know, in, in, into a better feeling of being involved uh, into the kind of a social scenario. So I think socialization, physical fit, and of course, exercise, because exercising will help you not just uh, staying in your routine, but also creating a lot of endorphins. Uh, listen to pep up music. Uh, get family together on Zooms uh, so that you can create an environment as normal as the earlier one. So let's start adapting to the new norm. All right, all right. Thank you, thank you so much. Now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Ranil Rajput for the word of thanks for the all panelists who you know took the time out and uh, tried to psychoeducate people and uh, gave wonderful tips for the audience. And I hope it was very very helpful for all. Mr. Ranil Rajput. Thank you very much <clears throat> everybody it's been a very very engaging enlightening uh, uh, interaction and i'm sure our uh, attendees have benefited uh, hugely from this interaction i must start with uh, dr shamshir divedi where he has given a very good mantra to everybody where he said that you have a routine you know if you have a routine it will hugely benefit everybody. 
another point, very pertinent point he mentioned to, uh, to our, the benefit of, for the benefit of our attendees was that more time with the family and elders have improved their condition. Uh, this is a very, very big lesson for, for all the attendees and, and personally, I think it's going to be a very, very beneficial for me. Uh, then he's also given a message that, you know, uh, it is this period has seen reduced health problems. So it's, it's a reset time for all of us to rethink as to how the future should be. You know, uh, over the last few years, the whole globe has been in the rat race and whether uh, we need to rethink how we all have to uh, begin to live our future because I think this pandemic will leave, leave a, a large number of uh, learnings uh, for us. And you know, uh, while answering to one of the uh, persons, he said that, you know, whenever you have a problem, don't brew alone. You know, share it with people, share it with the people that you can. And therefore, sharing can give you many times many answers. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Divedi, with the very useful tips to the people. And I'm sure everybody uh, will have big takeaways. Uh, Dr. Murli Rao, uh, I'm, I'm grateful to you for joining us from Chicago uh, during this uh, middle of the night, <laughs> early morning. Uh, uh, and, and you gave, I think, everybody uh, one of the finest mantra. You can control what you can. You know, this is an, a telling uh, thing. Uh, in, in few words, you summed it all and, and, and mentioned to people that don't worry about something that you can't control. You should be controlling what you can. Uh, then you also talked about boundaries broken. Uh, this is amazing, you know. Uh, we never thought about it. We never uh, related in this manner. That you know, when you are going to office, uh, you are you are uh, re-engineering the entire ecosystem and start thinking about the office. And when you are returning from your office, uh, you you are thinking about the family. And with this change environment, uh, this boundary has broken, and it is creating a new challenges for the people. Uh, you also talked about rebuild resilience. You know, it's an amazing uh, uh, few word uh, answer to the people that you have to keep endurance. And the best of all was when you gave four mantras to people, sleep adequate, exercise, and nutritious food and stress management. I think it sums up how people have to address their lives during this uh, period. I'd also like to thank uh, Swati Chavla, who has given a huge amount of um, uh, uh, her experience through the corporate world and also some messaging for the corporate world also. Uh, she talked about support from family. She talked about work-life balance, sharing responsibilities. And the best of all was account your day. You know, she made a very pertinent uh, statement that, you know, you must sit down and account your day, have time for everything, you know, where you have a family time, you have a couple time, you have a time for uh, uh, for, for, for your friends. So, so therefore, account your day. Uh, people must accept reality. This is another thing she talked about, uh, that, you know, a pandemic is there. Uh, we are all having um, challenges, and these challenges have to be faced. You know, uh, it's a painful time, okay? And when you have a painful time, you have to ultimately find how to fight it rather than submit yourself to these situations. So it's a, it's a great message. Uh, and then she also said, uh, which is another, I thought, was very useful for all the attendees, that you must update your skills and perhaps acquires you some new skills. Okay, so that uh, prepare, you know, this will help you going forward in your life. Uh, excellent message for everybody. And then she gave a message for the employers that don't throw 
surprises at your employees. Prepare them. You know, it's a tough time for your employees also. So therefore, prepare them, let them know that, you know, worst is going to happen so that they can also begin to mentally prepare to, uh, to address these challenges. And, and, and last but not least, uh, Prakriti Pradhar uh, made um, a wonderful uh, uh, contribution by sharing, um, you know, her experience with the volunteers, how people have come around uh, in, in, in sharing uh, 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 their uh, uh, time with, uh, with the people. Uh, and then she talked about unknown damages, unknown damages causing anxiety. Okay, so you have to be careful. You have to look at it. And she talked about family conversation. You know, we don't have family conversation. So maybe this is a time when people should sit down and have some sort of family conversation. Key thing is to ask yourself, do you have control over it? How it's going, how you must remain out of negative responses. These were the, some of the key messages uh, uh, Dr. Bodar gave, and I'm sure everybody will carry them. She talked about helplines that, you know, whenever you are under stress, you people should actually access those helplines and and not you know go down under uh, because of this period. Last but not least, uh, Divakshi Sharma, who conducted the entire session very well, asked most pertinent question that several attendees would have asked, and and I'm thankful to all of you, and and going forward, wish you all the very best, and all of you stay healthy. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Anil. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.